Nico, uh, Joy Mastrada with Clutch Points. Uh, we got to see a full year of Derek Lively, and just his development has been really incredible. I just want to get your take on his season and just his development, and maybe expectations for the future. Yeah, I mean, um, D, D Live, he's he's improved right right before our eyes. I mean, literally, um, the guy from the first part of the season all the way through to the playoffs, he's just continued to improve. Um, I think the sky's the limit. I think we we really we got a good one in him. Um, Def, uh, all defensive player, all star type type guy. I mean, who knows when his timeline will happen, but he's he's well on his way to being a special player. You mentioned keeping the top seven or eight players. Obviously, D Jones is included in that group. Uh, what's your optimism as far as being able to work something out with him? And do you anticipate that it will require some kind of tinkering to be able to get to uh, a number? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how we're going to do it, but he's a priority. He's priority one, one A and one B. Um, I think he fits in with our team. He loves it here. We have to figure out, obviously, the the, the dynamics to, to get him to stay. But yeah, that's a priority, and we'll do what we have to do to, to get it done. And so what are the other priorities of some? You mentioned one A, one B. No, I said he's one A and one B. <laughs> oh, he's one A, he's both, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how's Luca get 10 to 15 percent better? Uh, easy, I think. You know, if if you look at if you look at Luca one, we're not where we're at without without Luca. I think that's important to point out, um, and we also won't be able to get where we want to go without the best version of Luca. And if you look at a guy who had, you know, after game three had the world on his neck, you know, the scrutiny which was which was crazy, the amount of scrutiny that he had to face, uh, and for him to focus in and do what he did in game four, I, I just think it just shows. Um, the character of him and is willing to fight through adversity. Uh, and I think he's going to continue to get better. He's 25 years old. So I think just going through the finals, uh, him seeing uh, what he needs to do to be at his best in the finals after going through a grueling end of the year and then three tough, tough uh, matchups, I, I think you're going to see the best version of him. Nico, back to uh, Derek Lively and looking ahead at at his career, and you said, you know, sky's the limit for him. What is next, do you think, in terms of what you'd like to see from him in his development, and how do you guys go about helping him uh, have a plan for his first NBA offseason? Well, one, I think he needs to rest. Uh, you know, one of the things Michael Finley pointed out to me in my first year, like, they always talk about the rookie wall. It's not really that rookies hit a wall, but they go from college straight to workouts. Um, for the for the NBA combine and so they actually don't rest you know and so if you take a rookie like him went straight from college to work out to work out for all these teams to get drafted playing summer league they go through their whole first year and they don't rest and then you take him playing huge minutes all the way into the final so the first thing for him is just rest um, but his maturation um, the way he talks on the court um, his resiliency, all the stuff he's gone through on and off the court and still being able to play at a high level, like he's going to he's gonna get better. Uh, I think, you know, obviously the, the defense, what he did in the playoffs was amazing. You know, being able to switch off some of the best guards in the league and really contain them, um, the way he can block shots, finish at the rim. You all seen his shoot a three-pointer. Uh, <laughs> uh, he can do that. You know, we're not going to – he's not going to be a pick-and-pop guy. But eventually, he, you know, he has the skill to do it. But for our team, that's not what we're going to ask him to do. He's really good in the short role. He can even get better in that. He can pass from both sides of the floor. So I think he's just going to continue to get better. Um, if they guard a little guy on him, uh, being able to post up uh, and us having the confidence to throw it in and, and him finishing, which I think he can do. So I think there's a lot of room for him to grow, uh, and he'll do it. Nico from over here in the back. From uh, a year prior to missing the plane and knowing how that offseason was, and then this year obviously making the NBA Finals, how do you expect the offseason for yourself and the players to kind of be different coming off an NBA Finals mentality wise and just everything that goes into that? I think everybody's, you know, once you get a taste of winning, I, I, I like to believe that everybody's going to be focused like we are uh, to getting back there. And so that's, that's why I talk about everybody coming back 10 to 15% better. Um, I tell the staff the same thing. The staff needs to come back 10 to 15% better. And that's, that's mind, mind, body, and spirit. And I think, you know, when you play this long, um, it, it wears on everybody, even though you're winning. It's still, it's a grind. 
And so people need to take time off, kind of fill their cup back up, uh, and get mentally prepared for a long season. Nico, uh, kind of a multifaceted Luca question. Uh, obviously, in the middle of a playoffs, it's not in the team's best interest to be specific about how much a player is hurting and where he's hurting. What can you tell me, tell us about the extent that he was hurting? Uh, will he require any kind of uh, off-season procedures? And has a decision been made about whether he'll uh, play with Slovenia in the next week or so? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you guys, you guys all know Luca, and you you see the way he moves. Like he was hurting, um, but he's a warrior. He's going to fight through all those injuries. That's just who he is. He he loves to play. Um, but yeah, he's deaf. I mean, multiple multiple injuries throughout his body. That's that's uh, evident, and you could see the way he's walking and running. But again, he's a warrior, so he's going to fight through it. Um, in terms of playing for the national team, I think that's probably one of his biggest joys. So I think uh, as long as he can walk, he's probably going to go out there and play for them. That would be my expectation. Nico, you mentioned um, the staff coming back 10 to 15 percent better. Obviously, the reports with Jared Dudley and Sean Sweeney getting interest from other teams. Um, I think it's expected from a finals run. But I guess how do you balance letting them pursue those type of opportunities while trying to maintain them on your staff? Yeah, I mean, for, for both of those guys, we, we love both of them. We, we respect them. They, they've been valuable to getting us to where we're at. But at the same time, it's about people. Um, and, and our goal is to develop players and staff. And so if opportunities present themselves, uh, we're going to support them. Um, but they know how much we want them back. But it's about growth. Like, you can't, you can't hamstring players from, from, uh, or, or uh, staff from growing. So we're going to support them. And, but we do want them back. And, and we're hopeful that they'll be back. Nico, when you talk about right here, Nico, when you when you talk about the fifteen percent better, um, you know, where do you see that for PJ Washington, another player who's twenty five, part of part of the score going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I go back to I probably should have said this from opening, but you know, we really to get to where we were, we relied on four players who had little to no playoff experience: um, Lively, Gafford, um, Derek Jones Jr., and PJ. So those four players who you all know played huge minutes for us were a big part of our team, had little to no playoff experience. And so just think about what they've learned and then how do they come back uh, and incorporate that in their game from the start, I think is going to be huge. Um, PJ specifically, I think he can add a few more points a game, um, you know, taking the ball off the rim and pushing it, um, posting up smaller players, uh, shooting a little higher percentage from the three-point line, um, drop, penetrating when they, they run him off the line. I think he can... He can add a few more points a game, um, so he's and he's going to like he's poised to to continue to get better. But I really think just the, the experience they all four of those players got in the playoffs is going to carry them uh, into next season. And then and then as a front office, I'm curious um, when you kind of assess how the postseason went, how do you how do you assess a series like like Boston? At Boston is I think a team that makes it difficult on a lot of players. You know, the PJ, the Derricks, they were better earlier in the postseason. Um, how do you look at that series and say, yes, that's both the level that you as a team want to get to, but also that's a unique matchup that maybe doesn't show the true test of, you know, the true ability of some of these players who might have struggled a little bit more than they did in previous rounds? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't throw everything out the window that we did leading up to it. I really think that um, the accumulation of, you know, really being in the playoffs in March and then having those four grueling, those three grueling um, series leading up to it, I think, I think affected our, our ability to play at our best. And obviously they did too. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, our best two players are going to dictate what our role players do. Nico, I'm sure you're aware of <coughs> Rich Paul saying the Mavs would be among those interested in Bronny because you were basically an uncle to Bronny. What, if anything, can you tell us about that? Um, I don't think I can say anything about uh, players that aren't drafted. Um, so, you know, Rich is going to say what he's going to say. Uh, Nico, I'm a uh, you mentioned game three and the amount of attention Luca got. One of the consistent narratives that we've heard then and before is about his conditioning, um, health, weight. It's all from media members. 
as he gets ready for another season and now even this summer. Is that a priority or do you think that is something that is uh, uh, needs to be addressed for him moving forward? Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the things that you'll see is that with all the scrutiny, how he bounced back with game four, he's going to he's going to be reflective of of how does he get to his best? How does he get 10 to 15 percent better? And I think you'll see him coming back um, ready to, to address those issues. How would you describe the way your working relationship with Patrick Dumont operates in terms of, you know, trade deadline, draft, uh, you know, whatever business you guys are operating from a roster perspective this summer? How do I see it happening? Yeah, how, how, do, how does that dynamic with you and Patrick work? Uh, it's going to be great. I mean, uh, Patrick is, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of similar to what I've been used to in corporate America. You know, I mean, he, he runs a huge company. He's a CEO of, I think they probably have like 35,000 people. So <laughs> he's very much, uh, he's not emotional. He's more like strategic. Um, he's not going to be in the weeds. Um, but yeah, we're we're gonna be fine. We're gonna we're gonna have a great relationship. We already do. Um, I see it working very well. Nico, um, you throughout the playoffs, the consistent production from the offensive production from the bench was kind of lacking. Where if the seven or eight guys are pretty much in place, where is that improvement going to come from there? Well, I, I disagree with that. I think our our um, playoff uh, production from our benches was really good. That's why we won those those, ser those three series leading up to it. I think every game there was another guy that, that um, popped. I just, you didn't see that in the finals, but if you go back, you know, the Clippers series, OKC series, um, the Minnesota series, every game one of our bench guys um, rose to the occasion. So I, I, I don't really agree with that. Now it didn't happen in the, in the finals, but our team just didn't play that good in the finals either, you know, including our, our, our best players. So. It's tough when we're not playing good as a team to expect the, the guys on the bench to come out and all of a sudden they're going to play miraculously. Nico, you kind of touched on it before, but the Celtics seem to be poised for, for another run. And let's say it's the same teams that match up next year, hypothetically. What gives you confidence that the Mavericks would be different or better suited besides just one playoff run to get over that hump? Well, I think the biggest thing is experience. Um, you know, I, I said this earlier, we had four guys who had little to no playoff experience at all. So I think those four are all going to be better prepared. Um, and then also the rest of the team just actually being to the finals and now knowing what it takes to get there and not just get there, but also having enough energy to be at their best. Nico, I have a question about the guards. Um, we know a lot about Luca. Uh, first of all, what did you learn about Kyrie kind of off the court, things that maybe some of us weren't able to see? And then for a guy like Jaden Hardy, how have you seen his development and kind of where he falls into the rotation and where you see him and his growth points this offseason? Yeah, Jaden, um, big time growth. When he first came in here, uh, I think he was a scorer. Everybody knew he could score, but now he can, you know, he can see the passes to the corner. He can throw lobs. Um, he, he's really developed his three point shot is is really uh, solid so i think he's going to continue to develop um, as he progresses but he's he's been he's been great and he'll continue to be better uh, in terms of Kyrie you know i've known him since he was 16 so there's really not much that i didn't know about him um, but i think the things that you guys probably all saw about him is what a great teammate he is and leader um, and so it was great that people that are outside of his you know, his circle could actually see the type of a uh, person he is and the type of leader he is. And I think that's kind of been documented a lot lately. So heading into the off season, do you see this core staying intact? Do you still see, because last summer it was, we're still a few pieces away. Do you think you have all of the pieces or is still room to add? And, or is this an internal development deal where you just need guys to play better and, and develop for next season? Yeah, I think it's both. I think, I think, um, you know, like I said earlier, uh, our our core, call it the seven, the seven, eight guys that play the most. I, I don't see much changing out of that, um, but we're always going to try to get better. That's just that's just the nature of our job. Um, but there's one, there's there's one thing when you're trying to get a little bit better, um, you know, tinker on the edges, or you're trying to massively overhaul. When you don't make the playoffs like last year, like we were a little bit more desperate. Like when you go to the finals. Um, now it's like, how can we just, 
How can we get 10, 10 to 15 percent better? Um, I don't think it's a, a major swing. Nico, uh, right here. I'm just curious what the uh, what the past couple of months have been like. Um, you know, obviously the front office, you know, is going to do the job that they have. But as you're as you're also navigating a, a finals run, obviously you've been to the conference finals before and kind of had to navigate that. But what was it like, you know, with the team still playing and you guys are also prepping for the off season and preparing? And, and what's it like, you know, just in your day to day with the you know job you have, the jobs underneath you, you know, just about how that process has has kind of gone for you all? It's been a lot, but I mean, that's like the good problems, right? I mean, everybody wants to have those type of problems, so we, we accept them. It's also, it's also about leadership and delegation. We have a huge front office. We have a bunch of scouts. Um, it's really trusting in what they do and their ability. Um, I don't have to be at every workout. Um, we have a workout right now, um, but we, we have a great front office staff. They'll give me all the notes, and it'll be like I'm actually there. Um, so it's really about delegation and trusting, trusting the staff that we have in place, and they've been great. So. Uh, again, it's a little more work. Got to watch a little more film, but uh, good problems to have. It does. It doesn't sound like you're planning to spend a bunch of money in the off season, um, and there would be salary cap constraints anyway. I'm just uh, curious. We're going to spend all the money we have in off season. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that gets to the question that with new ownership, with the Adelson and Dumont families, what's your sense of their commitment to spending what would be necessary on the player salary front to go where the franchise wants to go? Yeah, I don't, I don't think money's going to be an object. I think it's doing it the right way, um, bringing in people with good character. Uh, th th money is not going to be the, the limiting factor. They, they want to win. Um, we're going to be smart about it, though. But I, I don't expect th – we're not having money conversations. I'm curious uh, your thoughts on um, with how the finals went and three-point shooting being such a big part of it. Uh, what are your thoughts on like the three-point volume that the team has gotten, and um, what are your thoughts on the shooting development? What's most important for an organization hitting into an off-season for shooting development? Just continue to shoot. I think we had, we got good shooting coaches. We got good development coaches. Um, you know, again, you don't want to boil the whole season down to how the finals ended, even though it was a disappointment. Um, you, you have to you have to kind of rise above that and look at the totality of the whole season. Look at the, you know, I, I like to say from March 7th on, we were in the playoffs. Look at the other series. We shot the ball fine. Um, can we get better? Yes. Will we get better? Yes. But I, I just don't want to look at the finals as the disappointment from that. And now it's like, oh my gosh, we're we're doomed. Like you get, you gotta you gotta pull up from that and kind of look at the whole season, and and that's what we're doing. I did want to ask: Are there any specific plans for Prosper uh, this off season? Yes, for him to get better. <laughs> no, uh, Omax is going to be good. Uh, the we we ha we had his uh, exit interview, and really for him, uh, we just want him to have a really good summer. Um, get back, get confidence, um, because the kid can play. He can play on both sides of the ball. Uh, and the goal for him is to come back in September in great shape with a lot of confidence and ready to compete for minutes. Um, you know, he's a rookie playing with a, a team with a, uh, a lot of good players in front of him. And so I think if he attacks this summer like like he will, he's, he has really hard work at the great kid um, that next year he comes, he comes back in great shape and uh, confident enough to compete for minutes. Yes, he's going to play in Vegas, yep. 